Um, well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, we have a packed agenda. Um, so uh, we're, we're gonna have to move things along pretty quickly. Um, so the first thing in our agenda is roll call. Um, then we're gonna do a vote uh, with the, uh, the council members on meeting frequency, whether we should increase those. Uh, then we have a speaker, uh, Mary Cummins um, from Canada, I believe uh, the province, Ontario, and they have uh, had an EPR packaging law in the works for many years now. And then uh, Reed, let's set, um, I believe if I'm saying that correctly, um, uh, from Yale, uh, going to talk about uh, some research on the impacts of eco modulation. Um, then I will be given an update on the needs assessment, and then I will also uh, be giving an update on uh, uh, some legislation discussion, and then we're going to open it up to the public. So without further ado, let me do roll call. So uh, is Lee Zimmerman on? I'm here. John Naiman? I'm John here. Naiman. Yep, I'm here. Frank, Frankie Sherman? Chris Tilzer. Eileen Kao. I'm here, Brad. I'm here. Yes, that's right. Kao. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Angie Webb. Here. Uh, Vinny Bevavino. I think he told me he wasn't going to be here. Frankie, I see that. Thank you. Uh, Michael Okorafor. Michael's out today. He is at um, um, a global event. Got it. Ellen Valentino. Mario Miner. Scott the Fife. I'm here. Dan Felton. I'm here. Thank you. Which, Dan, you're no longer with American. You're with the Flex Bowl. No. Or no, no, I'm with the mayor pen uh, through October. Ah, I see. Okay. Um, Abigail Stein. I'm here. Um, Delphine Dehan Sister. Peter Hardgreave. Here. Chad Miller. Here. And we have a uh, um, a new member um, uh, replacing Sherry Kelly Dorden with uh, Trash Free Maryland. Good morning. I'm here. I've actually attended the meetings as a me uh, member of the public, but I'm happy to be here in my new role with Trash Free Maryland today. Thanks. All right. Great. Uh, Martha Ainsworth. Here. Uh, Crystal Faithson. Miguel Lambert. And Gacharan Singh. Okay. Um, so uh, the next item on our agenda, uh, we, we're at monthly meetings right now. Um, but uh, in order to, uh, we were thinking about increasing the frequency of the meetings, maybe doing every other month. Um, so just wanted to open a vote up to uh, the council um, to see uh, if that if that's something that we want to take a look at, um, and uh, we can start scheduling more frequent meetings. Um, we are also planning a presentation from uh, Jeff Zero as well. Um, as a part of one of those meetings, but most of it is going to be talking about um, future legislation. So, just going to open it up to a vote. And uh, Ellen, you had a question. Oh. Mm -hmm. Ellen, I don't think we can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Oh no. About now, yeah, yeah, yeah right. Yeah, I just wanted to open up discussion on the frequency of the meeting, and um, I don't disagree at all 
um, but the content for the formulation of the recommendations sort of runs parallel, right? Um, the needs assessment yeah. uh, information, and then you know the frequency of the meetings. Um, so I did. I, I just wanted to flag that we can meet, um, and you know I think that's important. I'm going to make a recommendation that we also you know have a, a speaker maybe from Minnesota um, who recently just passed. Um, EPR too, but I just wanted to flag that, um, you know, Angie and, and Michael can, and you guys, everybody can make the determination, but the content of the needs assessment, um, I, you know, I think makes sense. And I know we're getting ready to go over legislation. You know, a recommendation would be is to, I'm, we don't have to, the bottom line is, should we meet more frequently? I, I support that. I just think it's important that we have um, moving forward, being able to discuss recommendations with with substantive data. That's that's all. Just flagging that. Yeah, and for one of our meetings, we are already planning a um, a meeting, uh, a panel meeting with the states that are implementing. I'll have to check and see if Minnesota is on there, but they, I'm pretty sure they are. Um, and if not, we can add them to that just to get the yeah. different flavors of EPR. Yeah. Um, and yeah, agree. I agree. For the vote, I guess, does anyone oppose the more frequent meeting every other week? Maybe that's a faster way to do it. Did you say every other week or every other month? Uh, every other week. Every other week. Okay. We're monthly right now. We were every yep. other month. Yep. We're monthly right now. Okay. And now um, we're at every other week. Would that mean a, a shorter amount of time? like a shorter meeting or it would still be the two hour window? I would suggest the shorter meeting probably gear it to more towards, you know, if we could hour or less, if everyone is, is not opposed to that. So I think if we're meeting more frequently, then maybe we can kind of shorten and really focus on a topic each and every time um, and make it get the most out of that time because we all are really busy and, and obviously adding meetings to everyone's crazy schedule is going to be hard and we understand that. So I think if we shorten it a little bit, content is to the point, um, you know, we can get things done. Um, Bradley, can I make a friendly just to try to say it twice a month and um, figure out what those two, that second one a month is? It's pretty close to every other week, but it's not exactly every other week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Work around the holidays. <clears throat> I think and, that's and and try to pull us, pull you know pull us in advance because you know October is already full. So, yeah. Daniel, um, you have a Daniel and Mario. They each have their hand up. Daniel, you want to go first? Dan or Daniel? Dan, me? Yeah, Dan. Yeah, yeah, yeah I would. I I support you know twice monthly. However, that works out. I do want to to Ellen's point. Would it make sense to give consideration to one of those two? monthly meetings being focused specifically on legislation and how those proposal might advance over time. I think that's going to take some focus. And I wonder if maybe it makes sense to to dedicate one of those calls expressly to that. And then maybe that's a shorter call and then a longer call for everything else that's substantive. Yep. Thanks. Mario. I was, excuse me, I was actually going to say the exact same thing that uh, Daniel just said. So, uh, but all Wanted to check in and um, on roll calls rather than a little late. So, mm -hmm. no thank you. No problem. Thank you, Jazz. You're up. Oh, oh, I have an unknown caller too. We'll get to the unknown. Yeah, I think every other week is unavoidable. Uh, I also think an hour only meeting might be a little unrealistic with a group of more than twenty people. Mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, I think the most important thing is just how much data we're getting from the needs assessment so we can actually make intelligent decisions. We have an unknown caller that raised their hand. I'm not sure who that is. I'm sorry, Angie. It's me. I don't know why it says it's unknown. <laughs> no worries. We'll let it slide, John. <laughs> um, you know, I'm kind of adding on to Chaz. I mean, I'm not against having more meetings, but it'd be nice to know the status of the needs assessment. So I'm not sure before we schedule the meetings, if Bradley can give us an update so we can kind of schedule the meetings based on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, that is um, 
a part of the agenda. We have a standing update on the needs assessment each each agenda item or each meeting. Perfect. Martha. Martha, did you have your hand up? Do you have anything you want to? Sorry. Oh, no I'm muted now. Uh, yeah, I think twice a month is much more realistic. And um, okay. it's not just that we're waiting on the stuff from the needs assessment, but there we're going to be discussing what we think the objectives of this, this uh, legislation, this program should be. And so there's other material that we might want to know. And of course, having, <laughs> having read through <laughs> draft three, uh, of the of SB 222 for, I don't know how many times I've read this, but there's an awful lot to understand there and some of these changes that have been made in the past. I mean, I don't know that that can be accomplished in a one hour meeting. So, I mean, you may want to dedicate one, one session to completely going through any questions we have about what's currently there and their, the meaning of it all. Uh, and that's my input. Great. Thank you. Jazz, you're up. No, I already spoke. Oh, okay, sorry. How do I take your hand down? Your hand's still up. Sorry about that. Um, okay, cool. No, all these right. are, I appreciate all the comments. Um, sorry, Bradley. Um, I think everyone has some really good points, and, and I agree. Um, you know, and I think we'll have a better understanding once we go through, like Bradley said, the needs assessment update that we have, and I think everybody will have a better idea and feel better about meeting twice a month and and, and um, hopefully we will have the data to, to be able to make some some good recommendations. All right, um, so let's go to our next agenda item. Um, that is uh, Mary Cummins, is Mary Cummins on the line? I am here, yes. I'm just sharing my presentation while you do the cool. introduction. All right. Um, so have had a few calls with Mary um, from uh, Canada, Ontario specifically, correct? And um, has been implementing ETR, has a lot of scar tissue implementing ETR, uh, which I appreciate uh, being the regulatory agency that's going to be implementing ETR in Maryland. Um, and uh, so I just wanted to have that perspective. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff coming from the states that they haven't implemented yet. So I wanted to have a presentation on uh, lessons learned and from actually implementing one of these programs. So Mary, I'll turn it over to you. Perfect, thank you so much. So um, really, I, I, I wanna, I, I was asked to come talk about what's going on in Ontario what's happening, why is there a RIPRA, what is 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 RIPRA? And so the focus uh, of this presentation, which I'm gonna try to keep to around 15 minutes for you, I know you guys have a very busy morning and I wanna give you lots of chance for questions, is really on that. Uh, why did the Ontario government move uh, from an EPR framework uh, to an individual producer responsibility framework? What, why did they do this transition when we had a blue box program with 50 percent funding with with an oversight body why did they create a ripra so it's kind of really going to be uh the theme i go through today uh and happy to cover any anything at the at the end as well or during if you feel feel you want to ask any any questions and interrupt me please do uh mary, so, mary i'm yeah. gonna interrupt you right after of course Tom Perrick, our pra and one of mary's colleagues we refer to our PPP program as the blue box um, for our American colleagues, and we'll be probably calling it blue box throughout, but uh, it's the PPP packaging uh, EPR program. Perfect. Thanks, Cameron. So uh, back in 2016, the Ontario government introduced uh, Bill 151, uh, and this was to replace our previous Waste Diversion Act. Under the Waste Diversion Act, what Ontario had uh, was programs that were approved by the government, uh, that were written by industry, submitted by industry, by one program operator. Uh, they were approved by government. And then uh, Waste Diversion Ontario, an oversight body, was given charge to uh, oversee these program operators, uh, these pros, uh, as, as they're now 
more commonly referred to than what, what Ontario used to refer th to them as, so we'll continue to call them that. These individual pros operating these approved program plans, um, really with it, it, the, the goal of just being a funding model, right? Uh, there were environmental outcomes in the program plans, but with no enforcement and, and no real um, teeth to them. So industry could could would report to, to Waste Diversion Ontario, here's how we're doing, and we'll report publicly, here's how we're doing. Uh, but there was no real need to hit any of the requirements that were outlined in those approved program plans. So the government saw that as a problem, and they saw it as a problem for a few different reasons. One, um, producers wanted choice. They didn't want one pro. They didn't want to be, more importantly, they didn't want to be forced to join one organization for which they had no say over. Um, we especially heard this from more local uh, companies, right? The ones that that uh, maybe wouldn't have that representation with the one pro model, and no control over how that one pro was operating. So, so that was the the first thing where the government was looking at the framework we had back prior prior to 2016, saying that that's not something that the producers are are enjoying. Our service providers also didn't enjoy that. So that's the haulers and the processors. So across the different programs, the haulers and the processors. Um, did not particularly appreciate having one customer <clears throat> and only one customer. It put them in the situation where that one customer would say, this is how much we're going to pay. And if you don't like that, we will just go to, to, to one of your competitors and we'll, we'll shop around until we have it. Some would say that that created a system with, with lower costs. Others would say it, it just created inefficiencies. And, and a lack of innovation because uh, the, going with the lowest cost denominator was causing no real investment in the system by these service providers. Uh, and then the biggest one was the lack of enforcement, I think, for, for the government. Um, this idea that there was no one who was uh, enforcing the outcomes of the, the program plans, which were often very detailed. Um, there was no one who had the teeth to make sure the industry was doing exactly what they committed to in these program plans. Um, and while the government itself had some enforcement power, uh, government uh, is busy. <laughs> and and getting attention on, on these files was, was difficult. And so, so the idea behind um, the government's desire to create something like a RIPRA, and we'll talk about how they did that and what we are and, and why a little bit more, uh, was also one of the main factors. So I think you've got, they wanted to, to have producer choice. You've got, they wanted um, non-detailed program plans where it gave producers more options on how to achieve outcomes. They wanted service provider competition and they wanted actual enforcement. They wanted these outcomes to be met uh, and, and not uh, be aspirational. So we began this transition Right, because we, as I said, under the Waste Diversion Act, we did have programs. We had programs with single pros operating these approved program plans with an oversight body who could really do nothing. Um, so you had tires transition. Yeah. We've had batteries, electronics, our HSP regulation, and lighting. It's a switch from what we sometimes refer to from extended producer responsibility to individual producer responsibility. That's probably one of the biggest changes that occurred. Uh, for the producers, at least. So, and one of the the parts that was really, uh, uh, we're still having a difficult transition with the producers, making sure they fully understand this. What it meant was that now, if I'm a producer, I don't just join. I, I'm not forced to join this one program pro. I'm not forced to then just write a check, you know, report my supply data that, but by to them and be done because there was nothing else to to do. Um, now I have to report and register with the regulator, RIPRA. I have to get my obligations, my requirements from the regulator. Then I have to go out and I have to find someone to provide me services to perform those obligations. So all of a sudden it became much more like other lines of a company's business, right? So it just felt, a, it's, it's been uncomfortable for the producers who aren't used to that, but it, it, it's interesting when you speak to other lines of business within the producer company, they're like, that's how we procure all services. This makes perfect sense to me. But anyone who had the history of how EPR worked, it, it's been difficult for them to understand that that's the transition we've gone through. You now have an individual role in determining 
how you actually achieve compliance with these regulations. These regulations, which are not program plans, they're outcome based. So they're just written and they say, here is what we want you to achieve. You now go figure out, you have ultimate flexibility on how you get there, on what you do, on who you hire to make it happen. So that's been one of the biggest parts of this transition is moving the mentality from extended producer responsibility framework only to individual producer responsibility framework where they have a much bigger role to play. Our biggest program that's still in transition, and you can see from the previous slide there, we started, uh, this is a 10 year transition in total. So to move from all these one pro operated approved program plans over to a competitive, uh, competitive system. Blue Box transition started July 1st, 2023, and it's going to continue uh, with its completion January 1st of 2026. Uh, once it's completed, the entire province is being operated by producers under an individual producer framework with a multi-pro competitive environment. Um, so, so that's been the journey for, for the Blue Box program and for all of our programs moving from this EPR to IPR, sort of a little bit about why the government did it, how they're doing it on the ground, like the different players, which is important to, to sort of uh, understand how the government set up this framework. They've The government itself developed the framework. So the government said, here is the regulation. And as I said, it's outcomes based. It's not prescriptive. It's not an approved program plan. It gives requirements, but no real way on how someone can hit that, that, that requirement. Ultimate flexibility for the producer. Now, producers can just simply say, I don't want that flexibility. That's too much. I'm just going to go to a pro. Um, there's more in the marketplace now, so I can shop around. I can find a pro if I'm a small, independent Ontario business. And it's really important to me that I have a boutique type pro uh, that will, will treat me like a small Ontario independent business. Um, I can find one of those now. In, in all of those different programs. We have pros in all of our programs, multiple pros, um, which is an interesting point that I, I do wanna say for, for those, well, RIPRA does not have a position on multi-pro or single pro. We really just do what the government tells us to do. Um, and the government has clearly said they want a competitive pro marketplace. Uh, what I do say is for producers who say they don't want multi-pros, why then does Ontario have multiple pros for every single program competing? So clearly producers are joining multiple different pros. Uh, so, so it's an interesting sort of landscape that's been transitioning here with that. But if a producer says, I don't want the complexity, I don't want the flexibility, there is a really easy path for them. They just go, they join a pro, um, they figure it out, right? They, they sometimes now, again, that confusion of, wait, all of a sudden my procurement department is saying they have to be involved in EPR because I'm picking a pro. So, so there's been, that transition has had to occur within these internal companies to understand that, but they are making that transition and understanding it. And once they get over that hump, they've picked their pro, they've sort of said, our pro is gonna do this for us. That doesn't remove their individual responsibility. It doesn't mean that if the pro fails to for perform, they get to say, well, it's my pro's fault. No, well, you chose them. You decided what services you were procuring from them. You decided how much you were going to pay them. You negotiated that with them. So you're still on the hook, producer, to make sure your pro's doing it, which also is a big learning curve for these producers who are now more regularly <laughs> speaking to their pro and more regularly engaged about their packaging, about products they're putting onto the marketplace, about why why are, are, are your services this price or that price. So so that that's sort of a dynamic that we've started to see happen um, as these individual producers are beginning to pick uh, pros. I see a hand right raised, so I'm happy to stop here. Scott? Oh, sure. I can wait to the end, but I it was it is on this part of the subject. Uh, Mary and Scott DeFive with the Glass Packaging Institute. Um, did you provide, is there a, is there a, a role, uh, to certify pros before they start to get members? Mm -hmm. Did the government or in the transition, you provide some sort of guide mm -hmm. to the pro, I mean, or can anybody just make their own pro, uh, and then you come together and then get certified that kind of thing. So 
are producers picking amongst an array of qualified pros yeah. or are people just freewheeling, you know, make up my own pro? And then a great question. It's a, it's a great question. Because a lot of producers assumed Ripper pre-certifies pros, but no one pre-certifies the fair market. Nobody says this company can do what they're saying they're doing per se, unless it's a highly regulated uh, market, which this this is not. This is set up as being marketplace, market forces. So so the idea is if if I not me, uh, but if I if I'm a, a person who says I see a business opportunity here. I have a really good idea on how how to collect and process material, and I want to I want to get in the game. You just register with Ripper as a pro. That's it. There's no pre qualifications. There's nothing. The onus is on the producer. Again, much like every other line of their business, to make sure that who they're contracting with can actually perform what they say they're performing. So so the idea behind it is is really just make EPR like the other lines of business you have. Right, so so that you're saying, what 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 are you going to provide for me? How are you going to provide it? How are you going to fulfill my obligations? Let's negotiate on that price. That's supposed to be what's happening. Um, there's no pre-certification. If you don't think a company has a viable business model, you should not be picking them as your pro, and you should be asking them what their business to meet your obligations. Sure, Make but sense? there's a deadline. Everybody's got to be in a pro or have a pro or be. By there's no a, deadline. Oh. What what it is? Yeah, there's no deadline for that. So so, and I will admit there was uh, some concern right at the beginning of all of this journey, uh, back in 2017, <laughs> uh, of what happens if no one makes a pro. Um, but that didn't happen in any material. Uh, whether it be some business opportunity, I think what we saw is the market responding and creating these these companies. So there was there's business to 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 happen here, and I think that's that's why that concern just never came to fruition. There, there are multiple pros. I have over 30 um, that, that came into this marketplace and said, I see an opportunity here. Uh, so it just didn't, didn't happen. And so there's no deadline because um, producers can do it all because of that flexibility. They don't need a pro. They, they can absolutely um, do this on their own. And we do have producers in every program except for Blue Box doing it on their own. So, so going out there and saying, I'm not gonna hire a pro at all. I'm just gonna contract with Holler. I'm gonna contract with service provider. The regulation's given me flexibility in terms of how to meet my accessibility when I wanna do it this way. And I'm gonna report all of that into Ripra and everything will be fine. So, so that's why there's no deadline. It's, it, I suppose really the deadline would be when a producer has to come in and tell Ripra how they met all those requirements. If they haven't selected a pro and they haven't done anything at all, that, that's when they're gonna get in, in trouble. Because then that, so it's not a deadline. It's more that you better have something figured out by the time you have to tell Ripra how you're meeting your requirements. Understood. Thanks. Yep. And we did have a question in the chat. Did the sure. framework preclude eco modulation? Mm -mm. It did not. Um, so so the framework speaks nothing, um, if you will, about money. So so what that means is <clears throat> if pros. And there are pros out there who include eco modulization in in how they charge their fees, and there are pros who don't. And so a producer gets to choose what they they feel uh, they want to have. Um, it's up to to the producer and the business model of the pros, and they all do it vastly different ways. There are pros out there that don't even charge a per unit or per kilogram fee. They just charge based on the size of your company uh, and your your obligation, and that's it. You don't even report su supply data to them. Uh, and they they perform all of all of the services that you need in order to comply. Uh, so then you've got, and I see that question. I'm coming up to that right now. So so we keep going there, Martha. Uh, so then you've got Ripra. Um, and so Ripra was created by the government. We're in statute. We're identified in statute uh, as the outside government organization that will enforce these regulations and the entire framework to achieve the provincial outcomes of the government. So, so the government has said, these are the competition, you know, whatever the outcomes are that the government's told us that they want to achieve. RIPRA is independent. We're, we're what's called an independent statutory decision maker. So what that means is the government can't tell the registrar or any of the compliance team how to enforce these regulations or what to do with these regulations. Um, 
it's a division of 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 that power which does have a benefit meaning when when someone comes and lobbies the government after these regs have come out saying you know ripper rippers enforcing against me the the government's able to say i can't talk to you about that we created an independent statutory decision maker under our laws they we can't tell them what to do same way we can't tell a judge what to do or the same way we can't tell a police officer what to do we don't we're not involved in telling them how to enforce the law so it's created a nice division um that that allows ripper to really enforce these regulations in this framework the way that it's intended to be enforced without that interference because that does happen on a political level uh it gave ripra a lot of powers and i'm going to cover some of those powers but first i want to talk a little bit about um how we're, we're funded so there's three things that make ripra unique and it makes it ripper relatively unique on a global scale so one that that we are independent from government that that government we may be accountable to government and we are accountable to government so so the government can tell my board what to do my government my government might say to the board of directors um we need you to keep your budget under five percent of last year right um but what the board can't or what the government can't do is we need you to tell the registrar to stop enforcing against company abc can't do that and my board can't say we need you to do that so that's the first thing that's really really key is we're outside government and we're independent but yet accountable right we're funded by the producers <clears throat> so producers that we regulate they come into us so that they they have to register and report to us because we also enforce against free riders so so those who those producers who are not performing any of their obligations so they come in and report to us so we know their their obligations when they do that they pay a fee and that fee is a cost recovery model for the pleasure of regulating all of them so so that's how we are actually funded we don't receive any tax base but what's the second thing that's unique in a lot of frameworks you have an organization a lot of european countries you have an organization that is like this that that you know does the enforcement uh, paid by producers, not a single producer sits on our board. There are no stakeholders on our board. Our board is made up of five appointees by the government, and that's that accountability. And then they elect the other six. No municipalities, no producers. We are not controlled by either government on our independent statutory decision making, nor are we controlled by the stakeholders. So that's the second thing that makes Ripper unique. And the third is, is what we're going to get into the fact that we are fully empowered, the fact that our government has given us prosecutorial powers, administrative penalties, compliance orders to enforce against the entire framework to achieve the government's policy objectives. Those are the three things that really makes RIPRA unique on a global scale. There's a lot of different types of RIPRAs all over the world, but we're the only one with those three. Paul? Yeah, just a quick legal question, because in the U.S., obviously, we have different legal forms. And I take, Mary, from what you just said, that this is clearly an organization that was formed somehow somehow under Canadian statute and then has its own existence. Um, and and could you just describe that a little bit more? Because in the U.S., obviously, a lot of the, the, the PRO organizations are, you know, ending up 501c3s, which are, you know, charitable purpose corporations or, or other things like that, such that they're formed, not necessarily controlled by government, they're formed by those who have formed them, and then they're subject to the, the stringent, you know, IRS rules and other rules with respect to have to operate. But a little bit more about that, just so we can understand, you know, the, the Canadian environment versus what a U.S. environment might look like for this. Yeah, so so Thank in, you. yeah, of course. So in Canada, we, we do have something called the Delegated Administrative Authority Model. Uh, and so this is where government is able to delegate powers to a, an organization outside of government. Again, this was a big learning curve for producers. Um, when we when we speak about Ripper to producers and the powers we have, they don't really fully understand it. But then when I say, but you're inspected by the Ministry of Labor or you've got Canadian Revenue Agency or uh, when it's car dealerships, it's really easy because they're heavily regulated by an organization called OMBIP, which is also a DAA like RIPRA. So then the producer starts to say, oh, I see. You're like all these other groups that regulate us as well. So I think there's 27 DAAs in Ontario where the government has said, a given power to a, an organization outside government 
to regulate a particular industry, to, to regulate, so licensing bodies, right? So, so regulating real estate agents, regulating retirement homes, uh, uh, regulating car dealerships, all of it is, is under this DAA model, Delegated Administrative Authority, um, that allows us to exist outside government and have government-like powers. Uh, on a Canadian level basis, there's, um, I can't remember their acronym right now, but they regulate all the immigration uh, companies that exist around the world to make sure that anyone who's who's um, hired services to to immigrate into Canada is following their their licensing and their standards. So so we BC has a fair amount. Uh, so depending on which province you are in, you'll see more or less. Uh, I think Ontario and BC are the ones that like it the most, and then there are some at the Canadian level, um, but they, they're they're ones that can be made uh, provincially. And a quick follow-up, and thank you, it was extremely helpful and very clear. So I take it then that there's a power to enforce, so the agency can legally go to court and, and institute Correct. a legal action, number one. I have prosecutorial number two, power, yes. I can prosecute power. Number two, uh, ability to contract. As, as an entity, it's able to sign contracts, and, and whether Correct. you're leasing office space or or, or whatever, you you can you can act. Okay. We Thank are in, we we are incorporated. We we are we are we are incorporated by reference in the statute, and mm -hmm. then our our corporate structure is identified in the statute as five appointed members, six after that, one ministerial observer, and then the ministry goes. And now you're 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 on your own, Ripra. So so we have a legal. We, we exist as a legal entity. Uh, and we have those powers granted to us through the government, and then we have an operating agreement with them on how we operate, right? But again, the really important thing is not on how we enforce. That okay, is you. the that, independent component. That is all very helpful. Thank you. <clears throat> Cameron? It, it, yeah, I just have a quick, uh, I want to pull on a thread that Paul noted about uh, pros being registered as charitable organizations. Now, Every province in Canada sets up their EPR network differently, but in Ontario, there's the um, it's silent on whether pro must be a not-for-profit. So we have a mix of for-profit pros operating and not-for-profit pros. In mm -hmm. another province in Canada, in Alberta, now they've clarified in their um, they, in their statute that a pro must be not-for-profit. So they've taken that hard line. But here in Ontario, we've got the flexibility, and then that leaves the the freedom of choice for a producer to choose do i want to um, contract and have my compliance services provided by a for-profit or not-for-profit entity so um, just clarifying that point that's a good point and that's why why i think we saw um that concern never came to fruition every program got multiple pros because people saw business opportunity uh because there's no restriction you can make money as a pro and producers sign up with for-profit pros who are very public about the fact that they are for for profit so so it's not um producers aren't just choosing not for profits and i also a good point just to, to give you a little bit of the canadian landscape there is a ripra like in every single jurisdiction in alberta in uh, nova scotia in in uh, quebec um but we're the only one with all three. There might there might be one that has two of our three, or there might be one, right? Like we're the one with those three things that, that make us a little bit more unique. I'd say the one that's the biggest thing that, that makes us the most unique is those powers. So so my you know, my colleagues in Alberta who do what I do are a lot like me, independent from government, can make statutory decisions, are funded by the producers, independent board of directors, but they have no prosecutorial power. So mm -hmm. no one with all three. Bradley? Yeah, so if the government didn't feel like the goals um, were being met, would they have the option to maybe overfile and pursue their own enforcement action? No. Okay. It, RIPRA is the only enforcement body, and we decide how to enforce, what to enforce, and when to enforce. And the government can't direct us on that. Um, it, it gives them cover. As well, I think the DAA model is very popular in Ontario for that reason. For, for 27 different DAAs, um, they're able to say this is this is down to our authority to to figure out how it's going to work. Um, now, what they can do, and this is really important, so the government can't tell me what to do, and my board of directors can't tell me what to do. I'm an independent statutory decision maker, but my board can fire me if they don't like what I'm doing. And the government can change the law if they don't like the way I'm interpreting it. So if I interpret the law a particular way and the government says that's not what we wanted, they change the law. That's how they they do, they don't call me up. They then would put something through to change the law. Make sense? Okay. 
So I'm going to power through here because I'm noting, well, although we're doing the Q&A at the same time, so, um, but I want to just keep, so why a ripper? So we've kind of covered a little bit of this. Um, it, it, it's given the government the ability to say, this is with the authority, not not with the government, when people attempt to come in and, and lobby them to say, we don't want this, you know, enforcement action taken against us. It creates an independence and a, a level of fairness as a result. Um, equity, if, if you will, almost, but we don't like that word as much as fairness, in terms of a consistent approach for producers. They know what to expect. Um, they know <clears throat> that there's an empowered body who can enforce on free riders. One of the biggest, we just came from our Canadian Stewardship Conference, uh, where many EU speakers were, and one of the biggest things they say is, is you know, we send we send things off for enforcement, but nothing nothing happens. Um, with RIPRA, things happen. We we issue, we've issued our first administrative penalty against a blue box free rider, um, and this is all public information on our website that 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 you can see that we 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 issue compliance orders. We're forcing the system to do what it needs to do, and that's probably the biggest value add for producers to see. So that's why RIPRA I see here. When you prosecute, is it the pro RIPRA goes after? Ah, it depends. So. The question was, uh, who do we go after? So it's individual producer responsibility. So the individual producer is accountable for everything regardless of having hired a pro. But there are certain things a pro is legally obligated to do as well. <laughs> so if if the pro fails to report to us, they can receive a contravention just, just like the producer can. Um, the, there's certain shared liability between the pro and the producer. And in those cases, I can choose who 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 we're who we're going after and context matters a lot to me in making that decision. So when you look at our our compliance page where this information is public, when the tire collection system wasn't working last year or two years ago, we issued compliance orders against the pros, not the individual producers. Could have been the individual producers if we we had chosen that, but it was a shared responsibility, and it was the pros we issued the orders against. So it really depends on the contravention and the context behind the contravention that leads us to make a decision like that. <clears throat> All of these, these powers are, are provided to our PRA. But what's really important about Ontario, and this is again something I think that makes Ontario fairly unique, um, is we have this concept uh, here, it's, it's uh, called regulatory modernization. Uh, and it's the idea that we always start with the idea that the vast majority of companies once they understand how and why, will comply. This is a model that, that goes throughout all of those 27 DAAs. So it's not unique to RIPRA per se, but it is kind of a unique to Ontario concept. Um, we call it communicating for compliance and lots of fun, fun uh, terms. But the idea is we spend the vast majority of our resources, of our budget on number one, because and, and we do see results with this. You explain why and how, and they'll comply. But if they don't, we have all these other tools that we look at a progressive way of using. So moving from one to six, highly unlikely. Possible, nothing says I can't, but highly unlikely. We're going to go through a journey with these producers. So, so compliance as a result does take time, um, but it is a more successful journey then uh, I like I like to say, as opposed to to making me a meter maid, where every single time there's a contravention, all I'm doing is issuing a bunch of APs. No, administrative penalties. No, that that's not what RIPRA does. RIPRA understands the context. We work with the industry, and and our goal is is the provincial objectives here, not to just issue a bunch of administrative penalties. So so it's really important to understand this construct. Uh, where the government's given us and other DAAs uh, like us these powers that this is the approach we take, um, that that we communicate, we educate, we we bring awareness, and when everything else isn't working. So when you look at uh, at that web page on our website, under I think it's public reporting and compliance activities, you'll see that's because we were done. <laughs> we were we'd gone through these steps, and we had to then say. We have evidence of non-compliance and either here's your administrative penalty or here's your order on what we require you to specifically do uh, and that's it. On administrative penalties, very powerful tool. They are broken up and we've only issued one today but within days there'll be more on our, our website. 
uh, and you'll see if you look at that one, it's public, so you can app, you can open it, you can see who it's against, you can see what it's for, uh, and you can see there's two components to it. It's a $340,000 penalty for being a free rider under the Blue Box program. 60,000 of it is calculated by Ripper on what we believe that company uh, avoided paying because they're not compliant. So it's a $340,000 penalty, but they could have complied for $60,000. So that's how we calculate it. So the, the producer gets something that tells them, like that's a very powerful tool. It's, it is not cheaper to pay the fine. It is cheaper to comply. Chaz? Yeah, two questions. For packaging, how many PROs are there? Are there any individual PROs for packaging? So we have pro, four pros for packaging, um, and there are no individual producers. Blue Box is our only program where no individual producer okay. is, is doing it on their own. They could. There are mechanisms built in that, that could make it possible. Um, but we have four pros. They're, they're all um, competing and active. They all have producers. They're all, uh, uh, and they all offer their services different ways. They all target okay. different sort of segments. The, the second question has to do with free riders. Mm -hmm. In particular with electronic commerce, there's an extraordinary problem I know in Europe with free riders. Uh, how are you dealing with that in Ontario? Yeah, so in Ontario, uh, a, uh, a company who sells directly to consumers um, is obligated as a marketplace if they have residency here or not. So what that means, we have companies in some of our programs who have registered uh, and are complying producers who have no residency in Canada. So our regulation states, if you have no residency in Canada but sell directly to consumers, directly in, you are obligated under these regulations. Now, what I will say is we're still at the beginning of transition, so RIPRA has not yet begun enforcement action against that bucket of producers. We've had a fairly high degree of voluntary compliance with that bucket. So, so companies reading the reg and saying, okay, we'll, we'll register, we'll report. When we hit a company who says no, um, whether or not a Canadian regulator can go after someone outside Canadian borders, we'll find out. It's the same challenge, to be honest. I mentioned the regulator who regulates uh, immigration uh, consultants and businesses across the world. They're, they're also faced with that same question, but have yet to attempt to enforce against, their, their law says they can, but none of us have, have attempted to do that yet. Um, but they're, they, these companies are registering with us as well. Okay, but with a company like Can uh, Amazon, for instance, which only directly ships a little bit less than a half of what it sells, mm -hmm. how do you enforce against, I, I can understand how you can enforce against a Walmart, but how about somebody who just does it as a side hustle? Well, if they're doing it as a side hustle, I'm probably they're too small for us to go after. <laughs> um, to be honest, we have a we have an exemption level, so so for efficiency, there's there's a cutoff. Yeah. So if it's just someone selling on Etsy, it's it's probably not going to be worth 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 that effort to go after you know a grandma who makes jewelry and sells it online. Uh, but ultimately, someone like an Amazon, first Amazon does have residency. Um, they they have lots of residency in, in, in Canada um, and it's public information. They are registered with us for all their programs. Uh, and so it, it's, it's really then between, it, it's really then coming down to a reporting question, right? And that's the same with retailers, whether you're online or brick or mortar, figuring out what is Amazon obligated for and needs to report and what, 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 what don't they? And when it's, they don't, are they they obligated in Europe? I know that they've made it a lot simpler and said Amazon, you're obligated for it all, unless that company's registered in reporting. So, so that made it a lot. That's a a really lovely regulatory approach for someone like me because it makes my job a lot easier. Um, but we do have to figure out okay, I, Amazon's only obligated for what they're obligated for under the law, and then my team has to go after everyone else. And and we work quite closely with brick and mortar and online retailers around that to say. Like a lot of our, our brick and mortar retailers in particular have started this new push where they actually require a RIPA registration number from all of their vendors um, to prove you're registered with RIPA. And if you're not, show me the email that says you, you're not, you're exempt. Um, so so there's a lot of work that, that goes on to make sure that information is correct. But I'm not gonna lie that the EU model of 
the the online folks are are registered or, or have are obligated for everything unless the person is is um reporting is particularly appealing what they've done there and um yeah. mary how, how much of your presentation do you have left honestly i think it just moves into is it working which it's too early to say and then qa which we've kind of covered so cool well i just uh, brad i just wanted to layer on one more point that that i think mary was hammering at which is um how the uh, producer hierarchy is defined is really important in uh in the regulation or in the program plan or rules uh meaning that you know you're not always going to be able to uh have an obligated uh, producer because they exist somewhere else in the world but uh you know working big e-tailers and retailers uh work we, we'll need to do a lot of work uh with their suppliers um to collaboratively understand okay who who is actually obligated for this product. Um, it's not just on uh, the regulator. There's a lot of behind the scenes work. Um, better understanding your supply chain and better understanding where those businesses are located to figure out who has to cover this cost, who, who's going to be paying the pro. Okay, I see a few more questions. I don't know, Bradley, do you want me to take them or give my email? I'm happy to talk one-on-one -on -one with anyone as well. Yeah. Uh, Chaz asked about um, online sales, and that was a, another question. Um, and we can uh, this uh, we can send questions through me to Mary, or you can reach out individually. Um, Happy either or. Either or. I have um, one question. I think is really germane um, for her since we have her here, or I can send online, Bradley. I mean, I heard your directive on that, but I think it's an important one. It's up to you. I would ask it, or yeah, let's make. Uh, you'll be the last one, and then we got to move to read. Okay, or the only one live at, at this time. Um, uh, you know, EPR systems, at least from our industry's perspective, are meant to make change. Um, what's your current recycling rate? Have you seen any kind of increase? Do you have any data around um, the betterment of recycling in Ontario since this change? And if so, maybe you can share that and send that uh, forward. Thanks. So the the one of the issues is that all our programs are still. This is our first year of reporting perform receiving performance from the pros, so so we haven't actually been able to look at that across the board. Um, we don't even have the data for Blue Box yet because it only we only have six months that transitioned in. Um, so so first, it's too early for us to to answer that question, but I think second, even once we get the data, um, the government expanded the obligation like changed the landscape quite a bit so for instance in electronics they they expanded the definition they removed some things they added a lot of things um blue box they expanded the definitions uh so so it's difficult for us to do an apples to apples comparison to say we're seeing increased resource recovery but what's important is that that's actually only one of the reasons we did this entire transition it, it epr isn't just about resource recovery um, EPR is about competitive markets. It's an economic model as well. It's about product design changes. It's about eco modulization. It's it it isn't just about are you increasing the amount you're recovering. So one too early. Two might be a difficult exercise for Ripper to ever perform because it's not apples to apples. Uh, but we're certainly going to try. <laughs> and then three, resource recovery is actually only one objective. Of, of an EPR framework. So um, is it working? We're, we're sort of looking at all those objectives to say, are we seeing increased competition? We have 30 pros. Are we seeing increased competition in the service provider market? We have new entrants coming into this province and making investments and building plants. Are we like, so, so there's things that we can point to around the objectives of, of EPR that we can see. That one we're, we're, we're working on, it's just a little too early just because we're, this is our first year getting most of the data. All right, sweet. Well, thanks Hi. so much. I appreciate it. Um, I appreciate the experience that you have um, in this uh, space as well. And uh, one of the goals of this advisory council was to look at different models that are being done on EPR, which is why we're doing a panel with the states um, and um, why we have so many speakers that are talking about the differences uh, between the different states that are implementing as well um and the different aspects um so uh just want to thank you for joining us thank you so much for having us again happy to have you reach out to cameron bradley if you want to share our information please yeah. do like anyone who wants to talk one-on-one -on -one, 
happy to if you want to filter it through Bradley happy to I know a few of you on the call um, so happy to to do it however however you'd like and and we're currently engaging with all of the states that are um, rolling out or the four or five states that are rolling out APR programs for PPP to provide um, advice learn about what's going on in their yeah. jurisdiction we're all doing this together so uh, one of our our big pushes is for harmonization understanding definitions how folks are defining recovery how folks are defining um, obligated materials and where possible harmonizing all in an effort for reducing administrative burden for producers all right okay perfect thanks so much thanks uh, take care we'll go right in uh, to our next presentation um read uh lipset with uh with yale um it's going to be doing a uh presentation on uh eco modulation i saw reed actually give a presentation at the NERC conference which i thought was fantastic and very enlightening um so i'll turn it over to reed right now And Reed, if you, you may be on mute also, I'm not sure. Now, can you oh. see my screen? Yes, yes, you are all good. All right, um, give me a second here while I... How do I get rid of this? Uh, I'm just having a little trouble. I'm sorry about this. I don't know how to make the, um, a part of the Google display disappear. So we are seeing your presentation. Yeah, it's I just I can't see my notes on, on my display. Um, well, I'll just wing it. So thanks for inviting me. Uh, let me jump right in. Um, what I'm gonna be talking about today, obviously, is one component of EPR, not EPR in general. This is eco-modulation. And um, I was going to ask you all to raise your hands if you knew what eco-modulation is, but I don't think that's gonna work on Google Meets. <laughs> so we'll, we'll just keep going. All right, I'm having trouble here because the controls are blocking. Um, you might be able to email your presentation to me as well, and I can present that could be an option. Yeah, if someone, well, I'll do that. This is a hassle, okay. Sorry, right, folks. And we will be posting all of the uh, the presentations as well. Okay, I just emailed it. All right. Thanks for your patience. I, I'm a I'm a Zoom guy, not a Google Meets guy, and haven't quite figured out all the controls on Google Meets. Sure, sounds good. And uh, haven't received it yet. It's probably going through a series of two at this point. So I'll start talking so that because I know you you guys are uh, you know the, this uh, bound by the time. So I'm a um, a long time student of EPR. I've been um, studying EPR since the early '90s. Um, I'm good friends with the guy who invented the notion, Thomas Lindquist, and uh, some of you have heard me talk about this before, so bear with me. Um, I am apparently the person who invented the acronym, not the concept, but calling EPR, calling Extended Producer Responsibility EPR. And so that is my claim to fame. As I've said before, uh, I think that's what will go on my tombstone. 
Um, I, uh, so I was working on this um, when my hair was darker and my waistline was thinner. I wrote the um, first academic article on this in um, 1992 and have been um, studying and publishing about EPR ever since. Um, my latest endeavor is a very extensive bibliography of, of more than 1,200 reports and studies that have been um, issued in that over the years since EPR started, and I'm hoping to make that online soon if I can raise a little more money and um, finish off um, some details. Okay, I'm hoping that that Brad has gotten my. Uh, I have not seen it yet. I've I sent it. Uh, been refreshing it, my email. Oh, what a hassle. Reed, I'm working from home today, and if you want my servers a little bit faster than the MDE one, um, I could put it in the email and you can send it to me as well. So I sent it to um, three people, to Sarah, Bradley, and Dave, and the one... Uh, Hi. Yes, I, I received it. I just forwarded it. Okay. Thanks for your patience, everybody. All right, I will. Um, I got it, and I will start sharing. Yay! Look at that. Okay. So, um, there we go. All right. So uh, most of my work is not focused in um, specifically in the US, but global. And I look at EPR and things um, beyond uh, packaging. So um, as I said, I've been doing this uh, since the early 90s. That's the article that I, I published and the um, reference database on building. Let's get to this. And um, I think this cartoon speaks for itself, and it may be the world's only EPR cartoon. <laughs> um, all right, I'm going to start by talking um, about eco-modulation and then talking about the challenges um, facing it and some ways to address it and wrap it up. So before I outline the basics of eco-modulation, I want to remind you that EPR is meant not only to increase recycling rates, um, and reduce the financial burden on local governments. It's also supposed to incentivize eco-design, that is to get producers to improve the environmental design of their products. Okay, so this is a, uh, a diagram of one of the typical ways that EPR is organized. You've got the producers there on the upper left uh, who sell things to retailers, obviously who sell it to um, households who then use the product or package and then discard it and some of it gets recycled. And under EPR, the producers typically um, uh, delegate their responsibilities for uh, compliance with EPR requirements to a producer responsibility organization and pay fees to cover the costs of that. And then in a variety of ways, the PRO organizes or subsidizes the collection and um, some of the processing of the recyclables. This should be familiar to most of you. So what's the problem? In, well, uh, it has to do with how the fees are provided to the, or the costs are covered and the costs are allocated to the producers. In most systems, the costs of services uh, provided by the PRO are allocated to producers according to them, their market share and the weight of the relevant type of product or package. So if a producer has, say, 20% of the market for that category that includes its packaging type or material, it pays 20% of the costs incurred by the PRO for managing that category. Unfortunately, that means if the packaging is redesigned to be more recyclable, the the mark and the market share doesn't change, then the 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 fees don't change, 
Um, so this reduces the, finan the financial incentive for companies to invest in eco design, what is one of the central rationales for EPR. And um, I think it helps to think then of eco, eco modulation as a way to restore those missing or muted eco design incentives. So you can think of this as three stages. Well, eco, um, first let me say eco modulation um, can incentivize eco design in, in two ways through increased granularity of modulation and through the use of bonuses and penalties. So what do I mean by increased modulation? Well, you know, the, the fees that producers pay are typically um, depend on the, the material or, or format of, um, of what's ending up in waste. So for example, um, there might be one category for all of packaging, or all plastic packaging, but increased granularity of modulation. Modulation refers to the number of categories. So instead of having one category for all of plastic packaging, there might be a category for PET and a separate category for poly polypropylene, the number fives. PET has a more developed infrastructure and uh, better markets, so it costs less to manage and will have lower fees if it's not combined with polypropylene and vice versa for polypropylene. So that means that the entity that uh, the type of package that um, isn't as say recyclable in, in a broad sense will pay more and the one that's doing well will pay less. Um, the third category, which you see in that uh, diagram is when uh, fees and penalties are added. So for example, there might be a fee for a package that has some disruptive element like ceramics on bottles or a certain kind of label on plastic bottles, um, or it has a desirable characteristic like recycled content. So the eco-modulation fees are on top of the regular fees that the um, that the producer pays. So essentially, the bonuses are discounts on the basic fee, and the penalties are increases. So some examples, you know, the uh, uh, the, the, the goal may be recyclability, and there's a penalty for those problematic components of the package, or maybe there's a discount that is a uh, a bonus for recycled content, or there could be a bonus as Oregon does for the use of life cycle assessment, um, and so on. Uh, the, the basic ideas are, are not complicated. It's the details, of course, that always matter. So this isn't new. This is from a study done for the European Union. And in the left column, you can see the number of European countries that have some form of modulation, separate categories by type or material. And then you can see in the center column, the, the countries that have this more granular structure that is more, they divided up the categories into finer, narrower categories. And then in the right, you see that there are some countries that do in fact use these bonuses and penalties. Now this data, is, excuse me, is from 2020, and there are, you know, if we were to update this, the right-hand column would have more, um, more countries using bonuses and penalties. So eco-modulation has five core elements to think about. First, which kinds of products or packages are subject to it? So, do the module, for example, if Recycled content is part of the system. Does it apply to all kinds of packages or just plastic packaging or whatever? So there's a scope issue. And then an important part is what's what's the focus of eco-modulation? Is it to stimulate recyclability or recycled content and so on? And then when we get into the nitty gritty, there's a question of how is the, recycl the recyclability defined? in technical terms, or how is recycled content defined? And then uh, another important and sometimes complicated part is what is the fee structure? So um, how are the, the, the 
bonuses and penalties divided up? What are the um, financial levels associated with um, each of those requirements? Uh, if you look at, for example, France and Italy um, and their eco-modulation for packaging, it's pretty complicated um, because they're trying to achieve specific goals. And then, of course, the question is, how big are the fees? All right, so some challenges. So this is um, what you might call a causal chain for um, EPR or an eco-modulation, you know, a scheme gets put in place, the producers respond in some way to the rewards and penalties, and presumably that changes what's put on the market and what's in the waste stream. The uh, end of life management is changed in some way. Obviously, recycling rates uh, are supposed to go up, and then there's some environmental impact. Um, Typically, environmental impact is measured in terms of recycling rates or landfill diversion. But I think it's really, really important to remember that recycling is an intermediate objective, right? What we want actually is an improvement in the state of the environment. We want fewer carbon emissions. We want less air and water pollution and the, and the like. And recycling rates, you know, um, are not always aligned with that they are an imperfect proxy for the things that we actually want to achieve. And unfortunately, in many, um, in most EPR systems, this issue is uh, not accounted for. So keeping in mind that recycling and circularity is an intermediate goal, we wanted to the best extent possible um, make sure that there are reductions in things like greenhouse gas emissions or threats to biodiversity or whatever the environmental impact is most important. And this is the real environmental value of both eco-modulation and EPR. Now, I read through the third draft of the Maryland bill and noticed that there was only one, I think, paragraph addressing this and no nothing built into the bill to uh, try and assess whether these improvements are happening. Okay, this is a very busy and complicated slide. Let me explain this to you. This is one uh, another um, interesting challenge. So the state of Oregon, as part of its planning for solvents policy, commissioned the study that um, this, I'm showing you here on the screen. Um, they did a, a, an extensive review of existing published research on the environmental attributes of packaging and food service wear. So what do I mean by attributes? An attribute is something like recyclability or recycled content or compostability. And the goal was to see if those attributes actually correlate with net lower environmental impacts across the full life cycle of packaging and in the process of doing this, the work was extensive. They reviewed 71 different life cycle assessments, and which contained 5,000 comparisons for 13 environmental product categories. So this busy graph you see here on the left uh, is the um, different environmental impacts that were uh, addressed, like toxicity, global warming, fossil fuel use, all our um, familiar concerns. And then what the bars represent are numbers of comparisons between uh, different packages uh, in the study. And when the comparison, say, between a package that has recycled content and a package having the same material but not recycled content um, are compared, if the recycled content one does better, that comparison is captured in the green on the bars. And similarly, if it does worse, that's the red. And those lovely little yellow diamonds are the net, the, taking the red and the green together. So what does this all mean? So the comparisons between packages with recycled content and packages lacking recycled content, but of the same material, the recycled content packages do better. If you look at the second graph, 
when you compare packages with recycled content to packages that don't have recycled content and are of a different material, um, it's the reverse. And then if you compare a package that's recyclable um, to a package that has a different material but is not recyclable, the results are mixed or confusing. What does this mean? This means that relying on attributes, rewarding or penalizing according to these attributes is um, scientifically problematic in terms of whether it produces um, environmental benefits. So when we hear companies say, we're gonna make our package either recyclable or have recycled content or be compostable by you know, 2035, it's not clear what the um, actual environmental result will be. And eco-modulation relies on attributes. And then there's always the possibility of perverse outcomes. Think here of um, the familiar grocery bag. When we move from single use um, uh, plastic bags to say something more durable that we can use over and over, the more durable reusable um, bag has environmental benefits if it is used multiple times instead of the single use. If it's only used a few times, then the single use package uh, bag is gonna be better. So we need to pay attention to how these uh, requirements or rewards and penalties are implemented so that only things that really do produce a benefit are rewarded. Um, practical, oh no, I've been clicking on mine. Are you uh, clicking, Bradley? Yes, I'm on practical difficulty. Difficulty Thank you. implementation. I got lost in the presentation. All right. So some other things that need consideration. Sometimes the incentives from eco-modulation um, may be ineffective because of the size of the, uh, the penalties. So this data on the left comes from France. Um, and uh, if you look at the right-hand column, it's the ratio of the eco-modulation fee, or penalty, I should say, to the um, retail price of the product. And you can see there's a, a range, refrigerator uh, ratio is uh, noticeable. On the other hand, if you look at the smartphones where it's 0.007% of the market price, well, that's not gonna provide any kind of incentive um, to consumers to change things based on uh, the market effects of e eco-modulation. And then there is a widespread problem with data management and verifiability. Um, just as the folks from Ontario mentioned, uh, the, the data are, um, in some cases, the producers or PROs don't want to provide the data, arguing that there are problems of, around competition or that the, the data are not audited in any way. And often the problem could also um, come from the state agencies or the PROs. As the uh, person from Ontario said, if there's no enforcement, if there's no checking on these things, you know, um, uh, we're not going to get good data, and uh, we're not going to know whether the data are decent. Um, there's also other ways in which um, there are data problems. I noticed in the uh, draft bill that there wasn't um, very much in it about the data management and verifiability it didn't seem to be addressed in, in much detail. And finally, something that came up in the last talk, that is when things are sold on Amazon by third party sellers, that is not Amazon's own products from another country, it's tough to get those countries say, there's a, um, a company in China selling electronic stuff to, um, consumers in Maryland. Um, it's not very easy to get that company in China to sign up and join a PRO. Um, and the problem with that for eco-modulation is that first, if the company doesn't participate, then it's not subject to whatever incentives have been created through the system. 
and the, co the companies that do participate are put at a competitive disadvantage. And then we have a problem that I think you may have already discussed in your meetings. Um, a lot of the EPR systems and the ecomodulation systems um, are not harmonized. Um, there are a whole lot of reasons why it's hard to get harmonization in place. But I want to emphasize um, one impact of this for ecomodulation. And that is that if um, say states don't harmonize around parts of the eco-modulation structure, then the market signal is really weak. So, for example, if California defines um, recyclability in one way and Maine does it in another, or the same for recycled content, a producer and and there's a bonus uh, associated with meeting those requirements then a producer may say this is just too complicated to to do this for two different systems or maybe it's even too expensive and so i'm not going to bother i'm not going to respond to that bonus i'm going to leave the money on the table and thus the incentives that ecomodulation is meant to create are are, are weakened they're muted All right next slide <laughs> evaluation is complicated um, it's really important. Uh, that is, we need to, um, well, I'm going to get to that in a minute. So first of all, if you look at the, um, the center circle, you know, it's hard to know whether the changes in products and packages that are put on the market actually arise from EPR and ecomodulation. They might, uh, the changes might be due to, say, the changes in the cost of materials or changes in uh, the market that the producer is competing in. And similarly, it's difficult to uh, figure out whether environmental changes like greenhouse gas emissions have arisen because of uh, eco-modulation. You know, carbon emissions can change because of the changes in the overall economy, um, uh, the changes in the power grid and things like that. So these, these are complicated and they require some sophisticated uh, research. So one thing I want to emphasize is, will we know if eco-modulation works? Now EPR, and I would say for that matter, a recycling policy has a poor track record for policy evaluation. The data are often really limited and not so reliable. And as I said, there are methodological challenges in research to actually figure out whether results that we see are can be attributed to the you know the policy in question and in particular there's very little history of examining the effectiveness of a policy after implementation there's a lot of debate when a law is being proposed and um, but once policies are in place it's it's not typical that there's regular analysis, what researchers would call ex post evaluation. As a result, as the OECD says about this, there's just really a lack of technical and financial data and understanding of what's effective. All right, how to meet two, uh, double click here, please. <laughs> um, so, how do we? Uh, um, do something about this. Well, one thing it, uh, we need to see or do our best to try and find out whether these policies we're putting in place actually uh, improve uh, the environment. And um, the most obvious way to do this is to use life cycle assessment to inform policy design. And there are growing precedents for this. Life cycle assessment is an imperfect methodology. Um, and it's complicated, but it's not clear that there are other better ways of doing this. Um, I think something to pay attention to is what Oregon is doing in their law for uh, packaging EPR. They have required that the 25 largest producers um, conduct life cycle assessments for 1% of the relevant packages every two years. 
And they've also done added a, a voluntary component that there will be bonuses that reward um, use of conduct of life cycle assessment. Now they're not tying the actual uh, fees and structure of um, their EPR to the LCA's quantitative outputs. What they're doing is getting the community to pay attention to, um, first of all, to get used to life cycle assessment, and second, to be more attentive to where the environmental impacts are actually occurring. Evaluation challenges can be met, first of all, by having better structure for data collection and data harmonization. And I think it's also important that um, the PROs are, are required to report systematically. One thing I did not see in the draft Maryland legislation was any requirement for reporting on eco-modulation. There should be reporting on how many penalties were imposed, how many bonuses were requested, and then granted. Um, without that kind of basic baseline data, uh, the, the policymakers have no way of you know, figuring out what's going on. And there are other ways that I can talk about if there's any time left. So let me wrap this up. I think restoring the eco-design incentives through eco-modulation um, will be not so simple as some people think. And I think it will be difficult to really uh, assess success in ways that tell us what we want to know. At the same time, um, I want to reflect on uh, a conference that I attended last week in California on packaging recycling. And I was really struck by the number of producers and entities in the packaging supply chain that were working really hard to adapt their packaging to the upcoming requirements from the states that have that are instituting EPR. And there's activity that, you know, from my 30 years in this field, I really haven't seen before. So there is something to this, but we need, you know, once these things get put in place to really look and see how much they got where we want to go. I would say more generally, I think it's very important to change the norms and how we debate this stuff and the analysis we conduct. I think it's very important that the data are available and transparent and verified. Um, so for example, if an industry group issues a study or an NGO issues a study and what they do is they publicize the results, um, but they don't provide access to the data and don't document how they did it, I think we should be skeptical. And in fact, I think our default should be, I'm not going to pay attention to this unless you tell me how you did this. Um, you know, if somebody testifies, well, go look at my conclusions. Well, if there's no way to check how they did it, um, I think our, our basic reaction should be, I, I don't buy it. Um, unfortunately, that doesn't seem to happen right now. And finally, I think there needs to be much more frequent ex post policy evaluation. All right. Uh, thank you. If you have an interest in um, diving deeper, there's a paper that I've published on this. And if you want the short version, there's an interview in the industry magazine resource recycling. And I'd be glad to answer any questions. Yeah, well, thank you very much. And Reed, uh, just for uh, context for yourself, um, the legislation that I distributed was the third reader of um, at, uh, SB 222. And um, it was, that was the version um, that uh, was out there right before the bill got turned into a study bill and not an EPR bill. So okay. when, just, we were, when we were distributing that, that was more for uh, a foundation because that's kind of where negotiations left off um, okay. and we'll help. And so we're planning on using that as a foundation and maybe and adding and taking away depending on the recommendations from the advisory council. Um, Brad, you asked me something in our email exchanges about consumer prices. Mm -hmm. 
And um, if you want, I can make a comment or two on that. Yeah, that because we we hear that uh, that prices are just going to go up, inflation's a hot topic. But I just wanted to get a better understanding of like, do we see that in real life, or can we attribute sure. it? it in, so so the, the the punchline here, I'll start with the punchline is, don't believe what you read from either side. <laughs> um, because it turns out that this is very, this is a, a really complicated thing to, to determine. Um, whether prices are passed on when producers experience higher costs is, depends on um, what's going on in the market that they're, they're selling into. So uh, whether they have strong competition or they dominate the market, whether their consumers are very price sensitive or relatively price insensitive, what economists call price elastic or inelastic. And it's not automatic that the prices get passed on, but it's not automatic that, that the producers swallow it. it. You know, it's that universal answer to all interesting questions. It depends. And um, so don't buy these, these generic universal statements and be very careful about what's being offered as evidence here because um, isolating the effect of the, the prices uh, so that you can be sure that they are attributable to this one factor is, is pretty complicated stuff. Um, and I've seen studies on both sides that I don't find acceptable. So, um, don't buy that. <laughs> so that doesn't really help you, does it? <laughs> um, I, but I think it's a it's a um, can be an important lesson. Uh, Chris, you had a question. Yep. Hey, um, a nice presentation. You know, you mentioned the requirement reporting on eco modulation was pretty important, which I, I took that as a key point. Who, who, in your estimation, has done a nice, a good job of that? <laughs> Nobody I found yet. So okay. France has been doing eco-modulation on the nominally since 2010, but in a serious way, um, maybe since 15, 14, 15, or 16. And um, I have tried multiple times to find out how they're doing. And every time I ask they, uh, for data, they send me their fee schedule. Mm -hmm. No, that, that's <laughs> <laughs> but right. I'm hoping that this gets better as more countries in Europe institute this. Um, and uh, I actually talked to one of the main PROs in France, and they said, oh, that's competitive. You know, that's proprietary data. Well, yeah. I'm sorry, that's BS. Um, this is a public issue, and the impacts on competition are um, much less important than figuring out whether the public policy is right. Okay, thank you, Reed. <clears throat> Martha, you had a question? Yes, I mean, all of your points, you made really excellent points. I'm also an economist. Um, how would you evaluate, I mean, why why use the commodity related fees? Why not just regulate uh, post-consumer recycled content or some other one of these other parameters and enforce that is there what are the trade-offs there so there's uh, that's a, um, a good question that um, people are debating um, I think that in some cases it's better to do it separately that we don't turn the uh, um, EPR policy into a Christmas tree with way too many ornaments um, at the same time I think that so, for example, if um, we're talking about a tax versus eco-modulation fees, taxes are very politically unpopular. And the political viability of, of um, providing financial incentives may be much greater if it's done through um, EPR. Another reason is that um, the, the burden of managing this is displaced from the government to the PRO when you have eco-modulation. Um, and then there's a, a political element that's not about the policy design, which is, um, you know, EPR's got momentum now and proponents see a window that's open 
to go after certain goals and they may worry that if they wait for a different policy instrument to be used, that window will close. I mean, that's, you know, that's political life. <laughs> and I should say some of my best friends are economists. <laughs> well, but yeah, but I mean, in terms of their impact on the environment, which is what you were talking about and being able to distill what the impact would be, would you say that the, perhaps a, a, a straightforward regulation might be more easily? It will resolve a portion of the challenge. So if you have, say, a requirement or an environmental tax apart from EPR, then you don't have the complexity of the eco-modulation fee structure, which will make any analysis more confusing and difficult. At the same time, the core problem that attributing a, a change in the market or a change in the environment to a policy remains. Again, whether the, the incentive is provided through an eco-modulation fee or a tax is still vulnerable to the problem that maybe these changes occurred for things unrelated to, to the policy, either one. Thank you. All right. Um, I uh, might have to um, put a stop to questions because we are running out of time and we have some more on the agenda. Uh, but Rita, really appreciate um, you uh, doing it. If you do have questions, you can either send them to Reed directly or yeah. send them through me, um, and uh, we can we can go from there. Um, and uh, I learned a lot uh, both times I saw you. Speak. Well, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. All right. Um, so the next item on our agenda um, has to do with uh, giving an update on the needs assessment. Mm -hmm. So um, I mentioned this at uh, our the MRF tour that we did with the advisory council members. Um, but uh, two meetings ago, um, or two months, I, I should say two months ago, I, I had mentioned that um, we had our nine sites that we were going to be looking at with the waste characterization um, study. There were some concerns that were brought up that we weren't necessarily getting to the right level of detail for that waste characterization study. We were really, initially, we were really trying to replicate the results of our 2016 study so that we can um, look at uh, trends over time, although two data points uh, is not a trend. Um, but it's, it, it would be informative nonetheless. Um, and so we, we are planning on um, uh, going to a low, lower level of granularity to uh, try and pull out some more um, impactful data, especially statistics to, um, to uh, different types of material packaging and whatnot. Um, I should also note that, that uh, I received maybe, uh, I want to say like 10 or 12 weight characterization studies that individual counties had um, had developed on their own. And we sent those on to our contractor to incorporate into the study. So uh, we do have more recent information um, that that will be included in our needs assessment as well uh, outside of the 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 waste audit that the state is going to be conducting and then um, HDR's um, subcontractor has done some of those studies as well so they are including the data from their own studies as well for their uh, clients that they have in the state of Maryland so it's more than just the nine sites um in terms of doing a, a waste audit and uh we are going to be a little bit more granular um in uh in in our analysis um than the 2016 study um so hopefully that assuages some of the concerns that were brought brought up in uh the last meeting i just want to let folks that know that we are um taking your feedback seriously um, the second item had to do with um, uh, 
with adding in a bottle return program into the uh, the needs assessment. So um, for the for the uh, and I mentioned that we were taking out the bottle bill, uh, the impacts of a potential bottle bill from the modeling effort, which determines the cost of an ETR program. So since we don't have a bottle bill, we aren't including that in the cost of uh, implementing an EPR program, but we are going to be talking about the potential impacts of uh, implementing a uh, bottle bill uh, in our report. And we ha also have some interesting data from the Container Recycling um, Institute. So just wanted to clarify that point that um, that it's, <clears throat> if you don't have a program, we're not including it in the modeling effort to determine the cost of ETR, but we are going to be talking about some um, potential impacts of a bottle bill program. And it makes it difficult because the, the references from SD222 to a bottle return program were actually taken out of the bill um, also. So if we want to appropriate money, it, it makes it a lot easier to uh, to do that when we have a very specific um, language in the law also. Kelly, you had a, a question? Yeah, thank you. I've looked over the RFP um, for that needs assessment that was posted on the EPR Advisory Council website, and I'm wondering, since the contractor has, you know, submitted a proposal and been selected, if you can share the full proposal with us, at least, you know, stripped out financial information, but the technical yeah, we've portion. Had, we've already had some stakeholders do that, and we can we can uh, send out a redacted version. Um, Angie. Uh, yes. Um, so I just kind of wanted to, I think a lot of people may be thinking about this. Is there a way, Bradley, that we can send out a timeline on when we should expect some of the data to come over from HDR? Because I think that's what's, again, what everybody has thought of is going to direct our meetings and meeting, you know, our, our additional meetings and more frequent. So yeah, and, and you can, so HCR did talk about the timeline when data would be available. Um, I think we are going to be having them give an update at our next meeting as well. Um, and uh, so that, uh, but we can, we can certainly um, send that out and it would be on our website as well. Um, and uh, just to give some folks on some of the things that we have finished. Um, we're, we pretty much um, finalized our stakeholder list for um, for the surveys. Um, we've um, gone back and forth uh, with our contractor on the survey questions, um, which we plan on distributing to this group as well. Um, and uh, the surveys are actually, I think they're uh, probably going to go out uh, within the next week or two. Uh, so we should be getting some data from that. Um, and uh, uh, just an update on the waste uh, audit. Um, so those are currently scheduled for the first um, for the first uh, two weeks of November. Um, and uh, we had some landfills that wanted to, uh, negotiate the terms of the access agreement, uh, which caused a little delay in that, even though these are the same landfills that signed and we sent them the same, um, the same terms as the 2016 audit. Um, uh, but uh, we did have some back and forth with their attorneys and um, most of them are actually signed without a hiccup, but we will be working through that um, uh, with our contractor also. Um, and, uh, uh, I see that there's a question from Peter also. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Brad. Um, just, um, great news that, that you're adding more, um, more categories. I, I just wondered, um, if there's any ability to share those categories, I, I, um, the categories can become quite important for the pro and planning for planning purposes, just to make sure that we understand how the, the data is going to be broken out um, so that we can yeah. figure out, does it meet with our categories? So 
um, if there's any ability to be able to share that, that would be uh, appreciated. Yes, and I can, um, I can, we can do that. Also, I should note that the law required, uh, and again, this goes back to when we were sizing the scope for this, the law required by county, by material, um, by recyclable material, I think is what it said, um, which is, which can be pretty high, uh, which can be pretty high level. Um, we are going to try and get a lower level of detail for them than that, and we can certainly send out uh, that list. But just know, since this um, needs assessment is uh, taxpayer funded, whereas in Colorado, it was the producers that were paying for that one. Um, and if you've been reading the news about Maryland's budget, uh, we do, uh, we, we took very seriously um, uh, the, the cost of this needs assessment and tried to align to the specifics of the law and not adding extras to that as well. So, um, so, but uh, I should also note that the original due date for the needs assessment was April 1st, 2025. Um, so on some level, I, I like to feel like we're way ahead of schedule. Um, and and that was before we lost our funding and the due date was brought in by a year to deliver that needs assessment. So um so we're moving it as, as quickly as we can. Um our contractor, uh, and if you remember uh the Gantt chart that they showed at the last meeting, they have many concurrent activities that are being worked on um, at the same time, which also adds complexity to um a project anyone who's ever managed a project uh, like that it's not a linear it's not a linear um a linear scope peter brett, brett just uh one follow-up just because um i think the bill the third reading of the bill i know is just considered the base but i i i just noted that the that third reading of the bill had the propane for the needs assessment i guess that boat has sailed um, so, so the the pro wouldn't be paying for the needs assessment then. So when um, when when it went to committee, I think that's the right term. Uh, that uh, was taken out, and then there was never an appropriation that was set up. So for a year, we actually did not have funding to even pursue the uh, needs assessment, even though it was in law. So. We had to wait a year to get that funding set up. So we weren't sitting on our hands. We were still writing the RFP and going through all of that. And um, and uh, we set we selected our pro and we convened the advisory council. Um, but uh, not having money to implement, um, it was uh, difficult. It made it made it difficult to work with the accelerated schedule, essentially chopping a year off the due date for that. Uh, Eric? And Eric Eric is from HDR, um, our contractor. Mm -hmm. He can, he can uh, uh, and uh, he can yeah, probably have more insight on, on this as well. And I'm, I'm sure he's working uh, late hours also. Sure. Yeah, thanks, Brad. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add a little bit um, of uh, of detail there on the schedule question and the timeline. Um, we're at this point where we are beginning to engage stakeholders. Um, so that's going to be happening over the next two weeks. Like Brad said, the survey to the municipalities and the counties, you know, the counties being primary, but then select municipalities are going to be included in that survey as well. Um, that's going to be going out in the next couple of days. The the surveys and undergoing testing now to make sure that we've worked out all the bugs, uh, because it is a very detailed um, survey, which should take anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes to complete. Um, so the um, the information from our solid waste from the solid waste plans available, combined with the information we're planning to receive from counties and municipalities, combined with the interviews of select haulers in the state and all of the MRFs and 
all of the composting facilities. All of that activity is happening over the next four weeks. And so just in terms of timeline, the ability for us to provide you kind of the report out for data that you can then use to discuss and help guide these meetings um, is going to become available based on that general timeline, but also um, the responsiveness of, of all of the potential respondents to all of those concurrent um, survey and interview process. And, and I should note that um, it, as one of our cost saving measures um, is a lot of the information that was asked in the Colorado survey can either be found in our yearly report because we already collect that data or the county solid waste plan. So as a cost saving measure, we worked with HDR to actually take out those equivalent questions from the survey because we didn't think that they needed to be asked because they were already asked and provided in the, uh, the reporting. Yeah, um, the, the surveys are meant to be completely complementary to the existing kind of MRA reporting mechanisms like Brad is saying. So all of our surveying is intended to get to that next level of detail that isn't necessarily included in the annual reporting. For example, tonnages of curbside recycling compared to tonnages of drop-off station recycling, just, just by way of example. So if you don't see, um, so those who are involved with maybe the Colorado or, or were aware of the Colorado, um, the questions in the Colorado survey, if you don't see a question in there, um, it's probably because it's already being reported for a report or is already in the um, in the, the county's um, solid waste plan as well. And, and all of that, that information is public on our website and has been for years. And just one last thing on the, the timing. So for the next monthly meeting, um, we would we are targeting to have that surveying effort complete and to be able to provide a preliminary reporting of the data analysis at that point. Um, so, I mean, that's just a couple of weeks away. So there's going to be a lot of activity between now and then. But that that's the, the timeline, just to, to add what, to what Brad was saying. Thanks. Um, we are running out of time. Um, were there any other questions I can hey, move on? Hey, hey, Brad, just this is Chris. Just one quick question. Um, on that stakeholder list, does that include the third party haulers you got from NWRA? Yeah, so uh, okay. it, it does. And um, we're currently working through, uh, we're doing a similar process that in um, Colorado, um, yeah. to, especially with regards to the cost information, there's some sensitivity around that. So it's going to be a very yeah. similar process. Okay. The data collection in Colorado. Martha? Yeah. Yeah, I'll put it in the chat. Um, can we get access to the list of stakeholders and the questions they'll be asked? So we're sending out the questions. We have also have a list of the stakeholders as well. We can do that too. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, all right, any other questions? Okay, um, the next item, and this is really um, the additional meetings that we're gonna be scheduling. This is mostly what we're going to be talking about, um, is uh, what do we want to be in the bill. Um, so um, so there's uh, different sections and there's different hot topics that we uh, that were um, in the bill, uh, in the third reader, I should say. Um, there's some things that we've already done, which don't need to be in the next legislation. Um, so, uh, I'm not necessarily gonna go through these right here because we are um, running out of time, um, but just, and this is just the cursory list, but what do we need to decide? Um, it seems like what are producers, what are the covered entities? Um, that's gonna be an important part of the bill. And again, we're gonna hash this out in the additional meetings that we're gonna be um, scheduling. Um, whether we want to have a single or multiple pros, right now we do have a uh, we have selected uh, our uh, our pro, um, uh, but that uh, that um, uh, just, that's something that we're going to have to decide if we want to do something more like what Ontario is doing or what some of the other states have um, done as well. So. 
uh, we need to have talk about a timeline. Um, and if we're going to be receiving a plan from the Crow, what's the content that needs to be in there? And there's already a good list of content in the third reader. Um, enforcement provisions. So if um, producers aren't necessarily meeting their goals, what are the enforcement mechanisms that the um, that the state uh, can do? Um, so give the authority to establish performance goals. Um, now, this was something that I talked about at our last meeting. We don't have to put everything in legislation. Um, that we can have a phased approach. There's gonna be an opportunity to really get into the details um, through either regulation or um, the plan that is submitted by the PRO. And the plan also, uh, the, the advisory council would have the ability to comment on the plan that's submitted by the PRO as well. And then the state would have the um, ultimate decision-making on that. So we don't necessarily have to hash out the exact performance goals, the covered materials list, or the eco-modulation goals in statute, um, we can, uh, uh, because we all are uh, looking to, uh, um, I think, uh, are looking at some level of starting an EPR program, we can, determine those things actually through regulation or through the plan that is submitted to um, NBE. So is there anything that I'm missing from this that we would want to, uh, that we need to decide for uh, the legislation? Martha? Yeah, the, the, the legislative intent and objectives. What? What we're hoping to achieve. Yeah. I, I don't think I don't think we I don't think we agree completely. Um, I mean, we'll discuss this when we get to this issue of setting performance goals. Um, but in a previous discussion, it came that you and I had there. This issue was raised is whether performance goals expressed in a plan are aspirational or actually enforceable by the. Um, by the state and whether we don't need some in statute. So I wouldn't necessarily dismiss that topic. I think we need to discuss that. Mm, I would yeah. I would advocate discussing the, the trade-offs there. Yeah, I have that as a note. Thank you. Anything else that we would want that we need to decide for legislation? This, this is really gonna, um, this is really going to be the uh, agenda for the next meeting. Scott and then uh, Abigail. Um, Bradley, thanks. Um, you know, one thing I've noticed in the other states um, is that the timelines for implementation, I see the timeline for review and revise for our plan content is, is in there, but not just those, but also the fee setting and the the registration, you know, the registration and things like that. I mean, it really is a critical. Some of the legislatures have been giving a, a very shortened time frame to um, implement and put everything together. I think mm -hmm. what we're learning from the first few states is that a little bit more time, you know, is is probably help going to help. And I think I that would, that would Peter probably, may not be able to say that. I'll say it. You know, he may not even agree with me, but I'll I'll say it. So. I think that was the intent of that bullet. Yeah. Also, the 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 timeline for um, the components, and we can do a phased approach as well, which some other states are doing. Also, um, I think Abigail, you were next. Yeah, and I think um, Scott kind of made some of the the point that I was wanting to raise, which is just. Some of this information um, is going to be theoretically guided by the findings of the needs assessment. And so, you know, if we're structuring this with the, in, with the idea that legislation will be introduced in January um, to kind of make decisions tied to a needs assessment that wouldn't be finished until July or, you know, sometime next year, 
um, I would just hope that we're, we're relatively clear on like what elements of it are going to be um, integrated and what what would be getting updated as we have the results of the needs assessment. Yeah. So in our uh, previous meeting, uh, we're planning on delivering the needs assessment in December. My apologies, um, but I still think if we're drafting yeah. the language now. Sure. Um, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, Ellen. Yeah, I agree with what you just laid out. I do think, you know, we can even compartmentalize these into meetings, whether it's the governance oversight responsibility of the pro, then the program and that type of things, the authority, the development, and then the execution. I'm, I, I just want to concur, um, you know, again, I'm going to point to Minnesota, but um, uh, there may be some disagreement among this group, but that doesn't mean there's a disagreement about moving forward with a single pro and a governance. So, you know, if we can phase this up, I think we can move this important policy forward um, uh, and, and continue to have, you know, we can make recommendations, but there's a general assembly and governor that's going to sit over there that's ultimately going to want to have input as well. So I just want us to keep in mind, I do think we can do a phase one, phase two, phase three, and if we can't agree on phase two and phase three, maybe moving forward with phase one um, as well. I'm just putting that out there. I'm getting way ahead of our skis here, but um, I, you know, I, uh, I think if we can compartmentalize governance and and then move the other two topics from there, um, there will be some agreement with being able to hold open policy uh, discussions um, for another phase or so on. Just yeah. some scots. Yep, I got it. I got that um, noted. Peter, I, I was just going to say one of the areas that that may be helpful to adding to this list is we um, are seeing in the other states some issues around clarity around definitions, particularly who is the producer. Um, we also have some areas that are coming up around clarity around what is actually obligated and what is exempted, um, and so there may be a need to look at some of those exemptions to potentially provide additional clarity yeah and i actually sit on a meeting with the other state where we are trying to do um some of that because it's very difficult to have one ppr start um getting implemented more to have 50 different um 50 different rule books that would that increases the complexity with um compliance as well very much agreed. Um, Chad? You're muted, Chaz. You're muted. Uh, some people prefer me to be muted. <laughs> Since no states have actually implemented their EPR for packaging law, uh, I think that's an argument for proceeding a little cautiously and learning from their mistakes. And secondly, uh, when it comes to goal setting, I think we should keep in mind that in the history of recycling in this country, aspirational goals, whether from companies or whether from regulators or legislators tend to fail. What we need to focus on are goals that can be achieved while improving the environment. Yeah, I, I definitely agree learning from uh, the other states. That's also why I wanted to bring in Mary um and i checked with the other states and they aren't copywriting their stuff so we can rip off and deploy what works all right if there are no other uh comments uh i know we are a little bit over time i'm going to move to the if, if there's any uh comments uh from the public And there is a tour um, at the Prince George um, Murph as well. I unfortunately will not be there, but my staff will. Um, and I know some of the other advisory councils. Um, Martha is um, heading that up. So if you have, if you're interested, I'd reach out with her or reach out to her on that. All right. Well, thank you uh, all um, for uh, this uh, 
uh, for joining us. We're going to be having scheduling more meetings every other uh, every other week. Um, we still need to figure out the time frame on that, and um, and we really look forward to presenting out uh, the uh, on the needs assessment um, four months before the initial goal that was in the the third leader the third reader. Um, so, um, uh, I don't have anything else and, um, and we could probably send out a doodle poll or something like that to try and figure out the best way for those, for those, cause I know calendar, um, calendars are starting to, uh, really get full. Great. All right. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you we appreciate later. everything. Have a good one. Yep. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.